Welcome to episode 205. Tonight on Book Chat, I am interviewing award-winning audiobook narrator Simon Vance. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, I am your host, Tamara Ford, and welcome to Book Chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. If you're new here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Here on Book Chat, we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, recommendation lists, interviews, and more. If you'd like to check out book reviews and other bookish posts, please visit the blog at shelfaddiction.com. Now a little bit about today's interviewee. Simon Vance has narrated books from classic authors like Leo Tolstoy and C.S. Lewis to contemporary favorites such as Anne Rice. Vance has a vastly dynamic audiobook portfolio. He began his illustrious career while at the BBC Radio as a presenter and a newsreader in London. After migrating to the U.S. in 1992, he has narrated nearly a thousand audiobooks. He's the winner of 68 Audiophile Earphone Awards, and he's a 14-time Audi Award recipient. He's an Audible.com Hall of Famer, and he has 33 years experience narrating. All of Simon's social media links are below in the show notes, so if you'd like to connect to him, you know where to find him. If you'd like to comment on something you've heard during today's episode, please find me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction, or call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe. The links for everything you need are below in the show notes. Simon, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for asking me. Absolutely. Are you doing good? Yes, doing pretty good. Wonderful. So you ready to jump into things? Absolutely. Okay, so to start, we know your credits are almost endless. <laughs> you have so many U.S. audiobooks as well as your radio history. So would you mind talking us through a little bit about your evolution into audiobook narration? Just a little bit, because I could probably fill the whole time with my <laughs> evolution into audiobooks. Um, I'll try and keep it quick. I mean, I was... Um, I always say, and I made a note on my own website about my father giving me a tape recorder when I was about 11 years old in the mid-60s, and uh, I've been making silly voices into a microphone ever since. That could possibly be the very beginning, the first, uh, my first experience in front of the microphone. But really, it was uh, through a friend at school. I got involved in local radio. Um, even though I went away to university to study important subjects, I came, kept coming back to radio, ended up getting a job at BBC Radio Brighton in uh, 1979, 1980. Uh, a few years, that's local radio. That was a small station. But then from there, I went to London in 1983 to BBC Radio 4 as a newsreader and presenter. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful job. And I had a lot of spare time on my hands. Uh, the friend who had helped me get into radio in the first place had been there as well. And while in London, he'd worked for the RNIB Talking Book Service. Uh, for charity. You don't get paid for it. It was a little bit of expenses, something like that. And I thought, well, I could do that because I like reading. Yeah. And um, that uh, that took place. I, I did that. So for one afternoon a week for eight years or so, I was recording audiobooks. And that I look on as my uh, apprenticeship. When I came over to the States, to California in 1992, um, I was transitioning into being a full-time actor, but I needed to make money on a regular basis. And a friend of a friend at the time said, well, you know, audiobooks are commercial now. You can make money doing them. And I thought, ooh, that'll be fun. I think I might be okay at that, having practiced a bit. Yeah. And um, I got hired by Blackstone Audiobooks in 1992 or 1993. I can't remember exactly and um, never really looked back. And, of course, the industry itself exploded in about 2001 with MP3s and so on. And uh, it became my uh, pretty much my full-time job since then. Wonderful. So you're exclusively with Blackstone Audio still? Uh, not exclusively, no. Uh, no narrator is exclusively with any publisher necessarily. Um, interesting story because there are still some books out there. You can find them on Audible online under two different names that are by me. It's Richard Matthews and Robert Robert Whitfield. Robert Whitfield and Richard Matthews. And the reason for that is back in the day, although you weren't uh, exclusive to any publisher, they liked to have their own stable of talent. So they didn't mind if you worked for other publishers, but you you used a different name. And it wasn't very important back in those days. But as things uh, progressed and I got better, and a part of that for me was that I was trying to break into theater and TV and film, and I didn't want, if I was a bad audiobook narrator, I didn't want it to be a drag oh, on no. my uh, film career. You know, it's like, oh, that's Simon, that's a great screen actor. Boy, he's terrible at audiobooks. Um, and it turned out that actually I was, 
pretty good, in fact, better at audiobooks than I have so far been in terms of experience doing film and TV and stuff like that, although I've, I've done all of those. Um, so I, I reverted to using my name, Simon Vance, on everything. But that's uh, just an interesting point going back. But no, I'm not exclusive to any one publisher. So what do you like best about audiobook narration? Uh, oh, there's so many things. Um, I mean, on a practical level, uh, I work from home. Um, this is sort of the history of audiobooks. A lot of it was done in studios, and a lot of it still is. But the, there's been a massive increase in home narrators. That allows me to work for myself in my own time. Um, so I, if I want to take a break, you know, if I want to do an interview like this in the middle of the day, it doesn't uh, mess up any other, anybody else's uh, schedule. You know, if you're working in a studio, you have a producer, a, an engineer at the very least, and a director possibly, and uh, you're, you're, you, you, everything you do is costing a publisher a lot of money. In this case, it's just me and my own time. So that's the first thing is, is the practicality of it. From the point of view of reading, I've always loved reading. I mean, I mentioned the uh, tape recorder my father gave me at age 11, but I was a reader. I, I was reading aloud before then. Uh, there is a tape recording my father made of me at age six reading Winnie the Pooh, which is quite funny. I can't remember where it's got to in the family right now. I should try and dig that out. But um, I've always been a reader. I've always loved reading. I love, um, I've got a pretty vivid imagination, which I think is crucial for an audiobook narrator. And I love falling into books. Um, you know, it takes me away for hours on end. I think that's the experience of a lot of people. I'm just fortunate to be able to tie that in with the ability to read off the page. And I, I put that down to um, very good sight reading skills, but also honed in radio. There's a lot of um, you're reading off scripts, but making it sound natural. So that's important when you're reading a book that you don't feel as if you're being read to, but you're right. with somebody who is telling you a story. So yeah. I, I love all those aspects of it. Yeah. Wonderful. Because that is really important. As a listener, I am an avid listener of audiobooks, and you can definitely tell the difference from someone who is literally just reading the page versus kind of letting it come to life, you know, for our ears. Yes. Yes, indeed. And, and I think there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of narrators, people wanting to be narrators saying, do I have to be an actor to be an audiobook narrator? And I say, well, you don't have to be an actor in the sense of having necessarily had experience on stage or any other aspect of acting, but you need to have an acting sensibility, which is the ability to empathize with the people you're reading about, to to put yourself in certain situations, to have a, a really good imagination. I, as I say, I call it an actor's sensibility. So it certainly helps if you've got um, acting experience and actors have a, you know, a leg up in that respect, they, they, they've learned what it is to empathize with a character, to, to possess, be possessed by a character. Um, but it's not necessarily something you have to have on your resume. Right. So when, you know, just practicing and learning to evolve as a narrator, do you think you've developed your own unique like narration style and voice? Or do you throw that out the window and try something different every time? I suppose I have. I mean, we we are all unique. That's an actor's thing to say. We're all unique snowflakes, you see. But um, uh, I think I've, I've not I've never worked at developing a style, but I'm sure I have one. And I think it's probably a question for people listening. I don't go into a book saying. I'm going to impose my style on this, or you know, my style is going to mean this in this book. Right. Um, what I do is, uh, and I said this to somebody recently, I, I, I asked, how does the book want to be read? You know, so I don't think in terms of the genre, this is a mystery story, or this is a horror tale, or this is a romantic story, and then change my voice or my style accordingly. I read the book and then say, okay, I think this book needs to be told in this manner. Now, it may be that I have a way that, you know, people can listen and say, well, that's Simon Vance, but it's not something I'm conscious of putting a trademark on and say, this is my style. Right. This is how I do it. And I'm not changing it ever. No, right. I'm, I'm open to, to changing things depending on what the book needs. Well, speaking of style, I mean, obviously you have a British accent and I've heard a lot of things from you with European accents. Have you recorded any books with an American accent? <laughs> yes, you noticed the British accent, did you? Yes. That's uh, yes. a bit of a giveaway. Um, yes, I have. Um, I do characters, a lot of characters, and oh boy, I've listened to some of my early stuff. And I, I as I say, immigrated to California in 1992, and I know in the mid 90s I was doing 
uh, American accents, even in as far as 2000. I won't name the books because people will go and look for them and laugh at me. But the, some of the accents were really not that good. And I'd like to think that over the years, I've developed a better ear. You know, I, I always played with voices when I was younger. I mentioned the tape recorder and doing silly voices. Um, and there's something about listening to the radio in England in the 60s and so on. We had a, a very vivid radio life, a lot of radio drama and so on. So, you know, playing at home with that meant I developed an ear for some kind of mimicry. I'm not a mimic. I don't, I'm not an accurate mimic. But, right. um, you know, I can listen to things and pick them up. I do a lot of South African. Um, I just auditioned from a South African book this morning. But uh, so I, I've got an ear for certain accents. I'm always a little tender about doing American accents because, of course, most of because I live here and m most of the audience I, I, for audiobooks is in America. Yeah. Um, and there's plenty of American narrators who are very good. I don't want to take work away from them. But I've done a lot of, yes, a lot of accents of all kinds. I remember back in about 2004 or five doing a book in New York, um, which was just a, a little uh, thriller just a little thriller. It was a very good thriller. And uh, it had many, many characters. Uh, there was an Australian guy who worked for the American NSA. Uh, it was based in America. There were a lot of Europeans in it. And, and there were just so many accents. And the, another one cropped out. It was supposed to be a Southern general. And I had to take a break because I couldn't do any more accents. I couldn't find. It was crazy. My brain just went flat. Oh, and no. I don't know if other narrators have felt that with when they're narrating. But I had done so many accents that go, how does a southern accent sound? I have no idea. Because it tends to, you know, it comes naturally. I, I tend to, as I say, I find it in my head, find a few words, something I've seen, something I've said, and I or heard other people say, and I extrapolate from that. But um, yeah, yeah, I've done America. I'm doing one right now. And there's a book I'm reading right now, which has, a, I'm a little nervous about it. It's a lot of um, young Americans in the future, uh, young American teens. Um, Exciting book. I'm interested to see how it turns out. What region are they from, the teens? They're from, well, they're from Los Angeles. Mm, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's it's difficult. I'm not going, the author specifically asked for me. So I dove in and I know I can pull off a, the general accent and so on and so forth. But we'll see with these characters. They're um, They're interesting. They're not specifically described as having, you know, beach bum accents or anything like that. But, um it's a challenge. Wonderful. Well, that's cool. I mean, the challenge is good, right? It keeps things fresh and exciting, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, all the time, we'd love to be able to sit back and put our feet up and not do the work. But <laughs> <laughs> the work calls to us and we get up and we do it. And it, it, it's good to keep us uh, keep us alert. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I know you've, you know, had a huge catalog of books behind you. But are there any particular books or even a series that you especially kind of connected to and you enjoyed immensely? Oh, many. Um, yes. I mean, there's few because it's not the first time I've been asked that question. And it tends to change over the years. You know, new books come in and so forth. And I forget books that I've said in the past. Oh, my God, I love this book. Things that stick in my mind are, um, I mean, there's one small book, relatively small. It's called The Prestige by Christopher Priest. And there was a movie made on it several years ago by Christopher Nolan, mm -hmm. um, which differs from the book somewhat. But the book I loved, and I got to know the author very well after that. Um, Things like uh, Dance to the Music of Time by Anthony Pohl. That's actually 12 novels that have been packaged together. If you buy them off the shelf, they're in four sets of three each. It totals about 75 hours of recording, Dance to the Music of Time. That was extraordinary. I always loved the um, the uh, Master and Commander series by Patrick O'Brien. There were 21 novels in that series. Unfortunately, you can only find that in libraries right now because there was a uh, another version out there by a, a narrator older than me who, um, uh, who when uh, there was a renewal on rights and, and my publisher lost the rights. So you can't buy them from Audible, but you can find them in libraries. That's uh, Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey, Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matcher in series of books. More recently, uh, I have to mention Jerusalem by Alan Moore, partly because that's like that was like climbing a mountain. So you don't often forget climbing a mountain. It was uh, 60 hours. Ooh. I recorded in one month. It's um, It was his magnum opus. Alan Moore is the writer of graphic novels. He wrote Viva Vendetta, Watchmen, League of Gentlemen, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, books like that. But this was a novel, his second novel, and it took him 10 years to write. Um, 
that was a major achievement. Um, and that won, uh, that won me an Audi last year as best male narrator of 2017. Wow, so. that sounds very challenging. How did you tackle all those hours of narrating? Well, uh, yeah, it's, um, I had a fairly tight deadline. Uh, it was a month for a, but for a 60 hour book, one book, it was, um, uh, quite tight. Um, in the event, I actually flew. Uh, he's a friend of Neil Gaiman's, who's another writer author you might have heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, and Neil offered to put me in touch with Alan and show me, a, and, and so that Alan could show me his hometown of Northampton, which is the book Jerusalem is sort of centered on that. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that. But I actually ended up flying out from San Francisco. I was living up there at the time on a Monday got to visit him on the Wednesday afternoon, flew back on the Thursday and got into the studio on Friday. And I tried to do a, about 30 something chapters. I tried to do a chapter a day, they're two to three hours each. Wow. Um, and it was a great help visiting Alan, uh, meeting the author himself, eccentric gentleman, rather, rather enjoyable time with him. Um, and, um, but the book itself is is set in his hometown of Northampton, which is right in the centre of England and is at the centre of so many historical events. And each chapter, or, or at least it, it follows through the history of Northampton from a couple of centuries ago, several centuries ago, and uh, right through to the present day. And there's a middle section, which he's described as, um, he says, Enid Blyton on acid. Enid Blyton is a children's author in England. Mm-hmm who writes things about the famous five, these little kids who go on adventures. And this this is like that, only these kids go into different dimensions. And uh, Alan Moore believes that everything has already happened. Past, future, and present has already happened. And these kids will go into a place where you can see the past, future, and the wow. present, and you can jump in. And it's so complicated, yeah. you can imagine. And he had one chapter in it, which he described as frankly unreadable. Um, which, of course, I had to read. Uh, it's about three hours long. Oh, good. And Did you agree with him? It, was it unreadable-ish? It was, it, was, uh, it was very, very difficult. If you know James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, which is written in a very extraordinary style, um, it was similar to that. So the words on the page, they don't seem to make sense, but when you sound them out, they sort of do. Mm. And there's connections within the text to other things. It's way more complicated than we have time for here. But I did read it. So it isn't entirely unreadable, but it was really difficult to read. In fact, I think it's better probably in the audio version than trying to read it off the page, because by reading it, bringing it to life, it makes it more comprehensible. Wow. That's cool. So that was really interesting to actually fly somewhere to meet an author to kind of prep for a book. Have you traveled to any other very, you know, cool places or unique places to prepare or do research? Yeah, I wouldn't call Northampton a cool place. It's sort of a, <laughs> it's a very basic city in the middle of England. But um, no, I mean, that was extraordinary. And I did that off my own bat. The publisher didn't, uh, you know, promote that or, or, you know, <laughs> didn't pay for me, didn't pay for my flight. But um yeah, it was just a little thing for me to do, uh, which I felt was essential with such an important book. Most of the time, we contact authors by phone. We just, um, you know, phone them, have a chat. I've met a few authors. Guy Gavriel Kay is an author that I absolutely adore right now. I've done a few of his books. Um, yeah, I think I have one of his books on my shelf, actually. <laughs> yeah, he's. Uh, we've made we've made good friends, and uh, I visited him recently. He he goes and stops in a couple of places. In a, he stops in a place for a month to write, or a couple of months. He goes to Mexico. Goes to all places. He lives in Toronto full time, but he came over to the west coast of the states two years ago, and I got to meet him and. He introduced me to Negroni cocktails, and I've been a fan ever since. Um, <laughs> so all these little side benefits from meeting authors. Um, but nowhere exotic as such. It's generally you meet them at, um, you know, on the phone or where maybe, if you're lucky, where they live. But, um, yeah. So I'm curious, since you've done so many different genres, do you have a favorite genre that you like? Um, I keep thinking about this because, again, it's a question that comes up. Um, the past year, I've been asked to do a lot of fantasy. Mm-hmm. Not always. I mean, because the range of whether it's a good book, good fantasy or, or bad is, is quite broad. Um, I love good fantasy. Um, I think it's a style of book that I like the most. And it's the one way the, the author is, you are in the, how's this sound? You're in the narrator's head. I mean, you are the person who is making the book, as it were. Is it first person narrator? That's it. And you're, 
if you remember, Bring Up the Bodies was a book I did a few years ago for, from Hilary Mantel. It's Thomas Cromwell, and he, you are in his head all the time. I love those books where you are observing stuff and you are feeling it as it happens, and it really in, involves you completely, rather than being a third-person narration or the voice of God, as they say, where you are observing from a distance. I love the books where you are in the writer's head, in the person's head whose story it is. I think that's that's more of a style than a particular genre. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, you know, you record a lot, but do you happen to listen to audiobooks for pleasure? Uh, Not that much, to be perfectly honest, because my time is taken up so much with um, reading for the work I have to do. And I'm, I have other things in my life that I'm doing as well. And we moved down to Los Angeles recently and I'm trying to um, get back into um, acting on film and TV and so forth. So I, there's a lot of classes I'm doing and stuff like that. So the time isn't available. The happy, when I, it's complicated, but my wife works down in Southern California. And when we lived in Northern California, uh, she used to fly down. And then for a while we rented down here and I drive up and down. So I drive up and down Highway 5 um, in I-5. It is. Um, and that's a five or six hour drive. And I would listen to audiobooks then. So I generally listen to my colleagues, people I knew, and a few other ones. Um, things like Ready Player One, I love. Oh, that was good. I've read, I listened to that recently myself. Yeah. But a lot of other, uh, I, I listened to a few books then, but I haven't listened to much recently, okay. which is a, a failing, I must admit, because it's always good to stay, uh, stay current with what's going on. And there are so many good narrators coming up that I haven't listened to, and I really should. Yeah. Okay. So before we talk a bit about your experience while recording Beast by Paul Kingsnorth, let's listen to this excerpt. Water came down from the cloud and sank through the black peat and passed over the granite and then went down through its channel to the sea. The water that ran over my legs and feet would never be seen here again, but the river never changed. I climbed into the river in the early morning and I stood there until the sun was highest in the sky. I let the water take my body away from me so that I could see what was beyond my body. I let the river numb me, and I understood that I had always been numb. The sky opened a crack, but only a crack. There was still something beyond that I could not touch. Water, thorns, rain... Black soil. All of the pain is an incident, a detail soon forgotten. Okay, so from my understanding, Beast is a contemporary fiction novella, and some are saying it has a bit of horror. D- does it? Uh, very minor. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not a full-on horror story. Fascinating thing about this book: it's the second in a trilogy that Paul King's North is is planning on writing. He's the first book was called The Wake. Um, that came out a couple of years ago, and he asked me to narrate that. That was set in around 1066 in England, which was the time of the invasion from France of William the Conqueror. Um, and it's written in a sort of stream of consciousness mode in a style of Old English, which Paul King's North didn't exactly create, but adapted so it was understandable. But much of the book did not have punctuation in mm. it, had very strange spellings and so on and so forth. But a fascinating book set in this uh, in this village with this guy, Edmund, Edward Buckmaster. Mm. Buckmaster. And it was a very strong re- uh, rural accent I used on that. Um, this book uses the same name. Edward Buckmaster is, is the main character, but it's much more recent. This is a man who is, the theme in these books is is nature and man's relationship with nature. And in this particular book, this guy, we never really know much about him other than that he's had some sort of a mental breakdown. He's left his wife and child and he's gone to live in this broken down old farmhouse somewhere. And he's just having a complete breakdown in the passage. Um, I read, you know, he's standing in the river. Um, And I, I, you know, you don't quite know what's going through his head, but as the book progresses, he, he, breaks down more and more his language breaks down and then he puts it back together again again big challenge to read but um a fascinating book and i i'm i met paul king's north he's one of the authors i've met he's been over here um but of course i did have a lot of phone conversations with him especially doing the first book to try and understand what he was getting yeah um but this one wonderfully has been nominated for an audi 
Yes, it has. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm uh, keeping my fingers crossed on that. It's always, as I say, a lot of good narrators out there now, and uh, quite a challenge now. And um, in uh, being a finalist in the audience doesn't guarantee anything. We'll see. Right. Well, good luck. Because um, when I listened to this little snippet, I I definitely felt that. I guess the words were kind of poetic-ish. You know, I was like, hmm, what's going on mm. here? They were kind of, I-, I wondered what it would be like to listen to hours of this type of um, prose, I guess. How, what, how was it for you to, how long was this audio book and was it difficult? Uh, I can't remember exactly. I think it was about six, five, six hours. Okay. Um, no, not difficult at all. I, I mean, the joy of reading something well written and i believe this is well written is that the words just flow mm-hmm. um i've i've described it as singing when it when it comes out properly i find that with uh, the work of guy gavriel k and many other writers as well um that it's it's easy to read because the words the words make sense right. <laughs> which of course they should but, but if you know what i mean sometimes when a book is not well written uh, it can be a bit clunky, and I, it can be a little, a little bit like trying to stride through a bowl of treacle or something. You can imagine you're trying to, oh, God, I've got to make sense of this. How does this work? Whereas with a book like that, um, they just flow. Mm-hmm. And the images are in my head immediately, and that really helps. Mm-hmm. And I can see what's happening. You know, I often, I think the difference for me between a bad book and a good book is that in a good book, the, first of all, the language makes sense, but the characters are acting logically they're not doing silly things i i mentioned fantasy and how there's good fantasy and bad fantasy and bad fantasy it, you often understand that the writer has got a place he wants to get and he will get there hell or high water and he will mangle this he will make people do silly things so that he gets there if you know what i mean yeah. you know it's the whole sort of you know there's a there's a guy with a chainsaw in the in the attic and one guy says don't you stay here i'm going to go up and have a look mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no that's stupid right, you right. don't do that um, it may be crucial for that kind of book, but for most books, it, it just, I hate it when people do illogical things. Um, that's different from, you know, in Beast, where the guy's having a breakdown, it may not appear logical on the surface, but it flows beautifully and it tells the story. So it, in that sense, it is it is not um, failing me. It's, it's actually supporting me as I read. Yeah. So this was the second book that you narrated in this series, right? Yes. Yes. I mentioned The Wake was the first. Yeah. So did you um, get any help from the author on the onset of this series as far as how Edward would sound or how you wanted to express him, uh, you know, verbally? Or did you just kind of create that on your own? Um, uh, well, with the first one specifically, that was 1066, and it was written in Old English, and there's, you know, so you talk talking like this all the time, there's a little more rounded, a little more country sound and stuff, and the words were written in a certain way with, um, you know, different spelling, the Old English spelling. So if you think of Chaucer, okay. um, Old English from Chaucer, it was made, it's slightly more understandable than that. And again, I think one that works better to the ear than trying to read it off the page yeah. and, and it takes a little work. Um, for this second one, because it was more contemporary, um, uh, I didn't need to do that. I So um, I, in terms of conversation, I asked him about the book. I, I can't, precisely remember what i asked necessarily but it was about the story what was his intentions um but the character of buckmaster no i pretty much uh, uh voiced him from what i thought he'd sound like um i've got a very um up i suppose these days it might be upper middle class british accent it's a standard british um so I, I i dropped it a little bit i made him a little bit more you know working class so to speak mm-hmm. a little bit slow you know so he, but but that was it, and that was that was primarily my choice. I think I gave him a slightly regional accent because I think he came for the same part of the country that um, Buckmaster did in the first one. Um, but uh, yeah, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a great, as much interaction with Paul on the new one. So was this? So he was by himself the whole time. So you only did Edward Buckmaster. That was the only character you performed. Yes. Yeah, he's the only guy. He's in wow. this. I don't want to say too much about the story, but he d- comes into this farmhouse. You have no idea where he comes from. He, he reflects on stuff, and you you pick up clues. He fears he's that th- there is a beast coming after him. He mm. fears that there's something out there, um, and he interacts. It's it's as I say, it's a lot of the interaction of man with nature, man's position, how we've lost touch with uh, with the, the natural world around us. 
Um, Paul mm -hmm. is very involved in that sort of um, ecological movement. He writes a lot of poetry and so on and so forth. And he's in the past edited newspapers on that subject. He He's a very interesting fellow. He runs uh, writing workshops in far small, distant parts of England every now and then. He's a, he's a fascinating guy. Very cool. Well, I'm definitely going to be checking out Beast as you are nominated with this book. And I wish you luck on that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Mm. Um, so, yeah, let's end things here. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you spending the time. Well, again, thank you so much for asking me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, everyone, be sure to check out the links below. You can find Simon Vance on Twitter. I'll also link his website as well as his Audible page. And you'll find a lot of books to choose from that he's narrated. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As always, I appreciate you streaming, downloading, and spending the time here with me on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. And until next time, happy reading. Take care, everyone. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that love pop culture, from books and audiobooks to TV and movies. I'll see you next time here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast.